and uh, to share with you some of the latest developments over there and to think with you about uh, something that almost happened in my life. I don't know if you noticed the title of my message this morning, but uh, the day I almost became a Pentecostal. Now, those of you who are here with coats on suggest to me that you're probably elders or something like that. And um, I hope that I will still have my ordination in the Christian Reformed Church when I leave here after I make my confession about nearly becoming a Pentecostal. But, uh, my dear friends, uh, that can happen. You don't have to actually join another denomination, but when suddenly you find yourself with people for whom the Holy Spirit of the living God is not simply a person they study about in their theological studies, but it's someone that they experience in their own lives. I'd like to read uh, several passages from the Scripture and I'm going to begin with the book of Genesis where we read this in the 17th chapter of the book of Genesis. Now, I don't have a bulletin in front of me, so I may be just a little bit off as far as what it says on whatever you have, but this is what the Bible says in Genesis 17. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I'm God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. I will confirm my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, where you are now an alien, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. Now, usually when we think about missions, we think about the Great Commission where Jesus said that he was going to send his people to all the world to bring the gospel. But there is a very real sense, and I believe this very, very firmly, that the great mission which is described in the scripture is first described here when God came to Abraham and he said, I'm going to bring nations to you and I'm going to make you the center of my work within the world. And there is a very real sense in which when you believe in Jesus Christ, you become a part of the seed of Abraham, part of the promise that God gave to him. Now, I want to turn to the New Testament, the book of Acts, the first chapter of the book of Acts where we find Jesus with his disciples. And I see that's right here underneath my Bible, so I'll read it also the same thing that you're looking at. This is what the Bible says in Acts 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was still alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. 
On one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the dates. The Father is set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside him. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand there looking up into the sky? This same Jesus who's been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you've seen him go into heaven. And I'd like to underscore in those words this message from Acts 1 where Jesus just before he ascends into heaven says this to them, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Congregation, of our Lord Jesus Christ. I mentioned Pentecostalism. And if you are an older person, you may remember that one of the things that reformed people were generally somewhat afraid of was the fact that there were certain kinds of Christians who sometime would dance around and would get extremely excited and I remember that when I was in seminary, one thing was made very clear to me, that there are lots of different kinds of Christians and a lot of them are very good, but don't become a Pentecostal. Stay in control of yourself, of how you think and how you act. And those words were appropriate because there were, of course, certain things about that particular group of Christians that were not perhaps entirely appropriate in one way or another. But the fact of the matter is, there is a Holy Spirit, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God, and it is the Holy Spirit today that is moving through the world. Pastor Fettus is involved in distance learning, as are those in Russia that I'm associated with. Distance learning and the Word of God can come to a person of Muslim background and they can hear about Jesus. But we must remember that it's not just a broadcast, as many broadcasts can be, but it is the presence of the Holy Spirit that is with them that can work miracles. Now let me give you my testimony about the day when I became a Pentecostal, in the broader sense, but in the real sense. In the middle of Moscow, there is a big, big building, massive. Everybody knows where it is, but it doesn't appear, or it didn't appear. During the times of war and during Stalin's time and Gorbachev's time, did not appear on the maps of Moscow. 
even though many people knew where it was. It was a KGB headquarters. Now, those of you who are older here, for you, the very letters KGB can fill you with an abhorrence because you know the ugliness of that organization. You know what it did, how it killed indiscriminately. Many years ago when I used to go there to Russia, while it was still communist, and have the privilege of preaching in one of the churches through an interpreter, the representative of the KGB was up in the balcony, the secret police, listening to everything that was said in that service. And when we left, the Christians that we were with that day, they would say now, to my wife and me, they would say now, when you're in your hotel room, don't mention anything that happened while you were with us as Christians. And so we were careful. We didn't talk about the church services that we had just been in. It was a terrible organization, the KGB. It was merciless. It killed indiscriminately. In fact, in that great big building there in Moscow, the lower section of it was all a prison. And there, the executions occurred. Just before the end of the communist era, we at the Back to God Hour received an invitation from a man by the name of Vladimir Zotz, who was in the Russian government, and he asked us, of all things, I can still feel the disbelief I felt as it came across my desk, will you please bring together a group of Christian leadership people and bring them to Moscow so that we can talk with them. We need to talk with these people. They knew their government was in trouble. And so it was my privilege to contact various people in Wheaton and some other places who had positions of leadership of one kind or another and say, would you go with us? And we had 16 of, 16 of us about. Mr. and Mrs. Dynica, who had been in Russian ministry for a long time, were there people from business, people from missions, people in Christian education. And we went there. And we could not believe it. In fact, within two weeks, Gorbachev was out of business. And the whole nation was not because we were there, but that was the way the time went. Within just a few weeks, everything changed. But before it changed, they wanted to hear about the, the kind of Christianity that we represented. And so we went to Pravda, the major newspaper. We went to other organizations that were related to the government. We met with Gorbachev himself and talked with him about Christianity. It was my privilege to talk with him about Christ. And he looked across the table and he said, well, I want you to know, I'll be honest, I'm an atheist, but Raisa, my wife, is a Christian. Ah, how could this be happening? And then we met with the KGB. And they took us to this building, this massive building. 
And it was interesting, some of our men and who had been out on the street somewhat, they'd been accosted by drunken Russians who had tried to get under their skin and talk to them. And when we went to the KGB building, there they were, but they were not drunk at all. They had been doing their duty out on the street, talking to us there, acting as if they were inebriated. And so we walked up to the second floor where the headquarters of the KGB was. And I can remember the fear, the excitement, the wonder that we were even there. And what would even happen to us? All people who were explicitly Christian, what would happen to us? And then the deputy head of the KGB walked into this large room. There were guards all around the edge of it. And he took his place at the front. And he gave a presentation. Nikolai Stolyarov, Major General of the Air Force, but also deputy head of the KGB. And he gave his presentation. And we had an opportunity to ask some questions. Alex Leonovich was with us. He was our interpreter. He was the same man who made sure that the back to God hour was proper for the Russians. Vorzhushenya Kebogu, that was the name of our program. And it had become very, very popular because we had the best speaker you could find. He had just been converted. He was from Kiev. He was a little Jew by the name of Mikhail Mogolis. And he's the one who spoke over the air. So his Russian was up to date and easy to understand. He was an editor and an actor. And so they knew this program. That's why we were invited to come there. Because of Mikhail Mogolis, who was with us also in that room. And Alex Leonovich. And so this man talked and we listened and they knew Russian and they had some questions and finally the rest of us could ask questions and some did. And finally, I couldn't keep from asking a question I didn't dare to ask. But I had to ask it. And I said, General, What about all the people who have been executed, murdered, right in this building that the KGB over the years has killed? And Philip Yancey writes about this. If you ever want to write or read about this, you can read it in the book called Praying with the KGB by Philip Yancey. But everyone was absolutely still. And the head of the KGB said this. Right now, there is a drama, a play that is being circulated in the southern provinces. And it's called Repentance. And that's what we must do now. And that's what we must think about now. I say in that moment, I just about began to speak in tongues <laughs> because it was something that would never be expected from this man. But he spoke it clearly. And after we broke up, I went to him and I said, General Stolyarov, if you're ever in Chicago, I'd like to have you on the television program I have over there. Within eight months, he was on our program. He had come to be on our program. And we traveled around. We went to Dort College, to Trinity College, to, to Central Christian High School in Pella, and some other meetings as well. 
And he spoke to them about the spiritual, religious changes that were happening in his country and the need for repentance. And on that trip, I remember one day he was sitting in my living room. We were all together getting ready to go. I think we were going to go to Trinity together. And he was sitting there reading the Gospel of John. And all of a sudden, he stopped us. And he said, here, look at this. This is what it's all about. John 3, I think it's 19, he said. The light has come into the world, but men have chosen darkness instead of light. The deputy head of the KGB speaking about how sin had come and torn his country and the world to pieces. It was amazing beyond words to me that this could happen. And later, oh, I could go on and on about study of and I must stop because that is not really why I'm here because I want to talk about what Jesus said here when he announced, when the Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power, the power of the Holy Spirit. And in that man's life, I saw it with my own eyes. When he went back to Russia, I'd been with him for about five days. We'd been flying around on a little airplane that the Vanderays had been kind enough to let us use to various places. And I didn't speak Russian, and he didn't understand English that well. And I couldn't really get close to him as a result. So after we left each other, I wrote about a three-page statement indicating what the gospel was all about. And later on, Mikhail Morgula sent me a picture of the general sitting in his hotel room reading that. And about six months later, I was in Wheaton, and he was there too. And I don't know the background of it, but I do know that I saw him just briefly. And he came up to me, and he had a loose-leaf notebook. And he opened it, and he showed me those very pages that were encased in plastic. The message of the gospel. My brothers and sisters, all this is related to the fact that our God is a Father, a Son, and a Holy Spirit. David Vendrunen, who's part of the faculty of Westminster West in California, has just written a little book about solo deo gloria, to God alone be the glory. It's something remembering the Reformation. A wonderful book. I recommend it to you. A book which points out that when we think about the glory of God, we should be thinking about the Holy Spirit of God. It is through His Holy Spirit that He reveals His glory. Already in the Old Testament, the Spirit of God in a pillar of fire led the people of Israel to the place where they had to go. It was the glory of God that Moses, by some supernatural miracle, was able to be for 40 days on the mountaintop in the glory of God. And Jesus, with all that he had done, the giving of his blood, the payment of the price of the sin of every one of us who is here this morning, he did it all so that the Holy Spirit would come into this world. He did it all in order that God's people would be called from all sorts of places. And so it was that the last words of Jesus 
before he ascended into heaven were about this subject that we're talking about this morning. It's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This is what Christ had on his mind as he was in this world with us, that there would be the coming of his spirit who would fill the lives of his people And when you've seen it happen with your very eyes in someone's life, actually in your own, when you stop and think about it, because there is no way that a person can become a Christian in and by himself or herself. The only way that you can put your trust in Jesus is that Jesus needs to give you his Holy Spirit in your life so that you know that it is true, all of it from beginning to end. I know one thing for absolute certainty, that I would never be a Christian if it were up to me. Never. But once Christ gives you his spirit. There is nothing that will shake you or make you afraid or unwilling to go wherever he sends you and to do his will. And while it's true that I have never left the Christian Reformed Church, as you know, I would have to say that within this church of ours, we don't talk about this very much or think about it enough. You know what we think about? When you're involved in missions, as I've been involved in missions for many, many years, they say, oh, you're, oh, you're a Calvinist. Yes? You believe in election, don't you? Yes. But that's the only thing they think about when they think about Calvinists. Predestination and things like that. And is it not true that we ourselves sometime can be so preoccupied with those ideas that being a Christian, being a Christian can simply mean being a member, a member of the predestinated ones, the ones whom God has known from before the foundation of the world and into whose lives he has sent his spirit. Yes, indeed, he has. But he gives you the assurance of salvation because you believe in that election. I believe in election. But I also know that that truth, if it is not accompanied by your recognition that because you are his elect, you must display the power of God in your life. If you do not, I'm just turned here to this book of 2 Peter. You know Peter, the apostle. Oh, he was so proud. He was on the mountain of transfiguration with Jesus. And he saw him glorified before his very eyes. But when they came 
to take Jesus to the cross. Peter fled like anyone else. But when Pentecost came, when the Holy Spirit came, this man was really changed. First Peter, this is what it says. The divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who has called us by his glory and goodness. Through these he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption of the world. That's what Peter said. This is what it means to be a Christian. It means to be changed in the depths of your heart. And so Peter says in this very same passage, yeah, are you saved by faith alone, right? By faith alone, yes, 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 yes. But Peter says, when you're saved by faith alone, please understand, it's not just believing the Apostles' Creed that brings you into glory, but add to your faith knowledge. He says that in this very chapter, this first chapter of Second Peter, add to your faith, faith knowledge. And to your knowledge, goodness. And to your goodness, self-control. And to your self-control, perseverance. And to your perseverance, godliness. And to your godliness, Add brotherly kindness. And to your brotherly kindness, add love. There is a transformation of a human being through the work of the Holy Spirit in people's lives. And it can happen to people from whom you would least expect it. The deputy head of the KGB saying to me, from now on, we need to talk about repentance. And I see him reading his Bible. And when I see that and think of it, I say, what about us? I grew up in the Christian Reformed Church. I won't tell you what year I was born, but it was in the Depression. And sometimes I still get depressed because we can be so satisfied simply with our membership and proud, perhaps, of some of the things which God has let us do. But the truth is that we need the Holy Spirit, my brothers and sisters. We need the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We need to be thinking about the Holy Spirit. We need to be asking God each day to strengthen us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that doesn't mean we're going to be standing on a street corner somewhere and stamping our feet as I would see in Moscow, these Pentecostals. Oh, we don't want it. No, 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 no. We're not talking about that. We're talking about people who know that God is in them through his spirit and he gives them a word to do. I hadn't been here for, for, for a year, uh, as you know, and I, I, 
I, I hardly remember my own name anymore when you get my age, but so I don't remember exactly what this congregation was like, but I'm so pleased to see all of you young people here. And when I say young people, that's anybody less than 50, by the way. And when I see you and I think of the, the months, the years, the days that you could still have in this world, do you understand that you need the Holy Spirit of the living God and you need to have his power and he will use you wonderfully. Thank you, Jesus, for those last words you spoke before you ascended into heaven. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will become a kind of Pentecostal God wants you to be. Amen. Let's have a prayer. Dear God, we thank you for your sacred scripture. We talk about the Holy Spirit. Lord, we're talking about the work of God on the pages of a book. That's where it starts. We need to be people who are reading about this book, reading in the book, reading about Jesus, thinking about Jesus, thinking about the, the wonderful demonstration of the glory of God as he led his people through the desert. Now, oh God, please come into our lives in this desert which we call the United States of America with its high-powered ways of communicating falsehood and dirtiness to Christians. Oh God, Holy Spirit of the living God, fall upon us together and use us mightily. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.